All right, let's go ahead and get started. We'll be in the book of Titus. The first thing we looked at was the qualifications for elders. This is Titus's job description. This is why Paul left Titus in Crete to, to do this. This is who we're looking for. Here's the, the job description. Here's the men that we are looking for. And then we looked at last week the context of the elders. Where are they functioning in where we're looking? And what, what was, just talk to me a little bit, what's the, the difference between who we're looking for and the people around that, that, that were in that area, or the pool, I guess, that you're drawn from? Tell me, tell me the difference between them. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Not what they needed to be. I think evil was a good, good description. Exactly. Polar opposites. I mean, so imagine this is your job. Hey, here's, here's what you got to do. You got to find men like this. And you look around and, and you see that the people that you have to, to work with are the exact opposite. You're trying to build a championship team and you have like the people that flunked out of everything. They, they, I mean, they can't, they can't hold the ball straight. One of the things that we uh, I, I coached first and second grade basketball when I was in, when we were in Wichita for upward basketball, I don't know if you've ever seen that, that, uh, that kind of association, but I coached first and second grade basketball. And at that point, you're not teaching anything really other than fundamentals. You're just teaching them literally how to dribble. And the first time that I met my kids in one of the seasons, I just looked and I said, I don't, I don't know how this is going to go. And I'm so competitive that it, it already frustrated me at the beginning of the season. And I was getting upset. And Mindy's like, they're first and second graders. You can, you can work with them. You can. And it was amazing to see how they went from who they were when they started to the end of the season. It was a, it was a really neat thing. In fact, we made the news that season. We sent in a clip. There was uh, w- That season... Myself and one of my youth leaders, I was the youth pastor there, one of my youth leaders, we were the only two teams in that age bracket. So we played each other for 12 weeks straight. And we built up quite a rivalry because he would win one and I would win one. In the last game of the season, one of his kids uh, just shot a half-court shot with the, the clock running down and he made it and the whole crowd erupted. I mean, as much as of humanity who is so far away from the ideal that we have looked at. And so the point that we've talked about, we talked about this last week, is not that you're going to be searching for these unicorns. You're not going to be searching, going door to door this morning that I had preached very, very early on in my ministry, in my pastoral ministry in 2016. And it's an amazing thing and it's a humbling thing to look back on where you've been as a preacher since then, but it's, it's really neat to see God, and we're going to see what this looks like, but this is one of my favorite things, to preach about preaching. And in fact, in the future, if I reference this sermon, it's going to be preaching about preaching about preaching, and I think... As deep as I can get into that, into that rabbit trail. But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing as we study this. We're, gonna, we're just going to cover one verse this evening, and then we'll expand a little bit more. We will see a sneak preview of what's coming, but uh, tonight, really, I want to focus in on Titus chapter 2, verse 1. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we come to you, and I, and I recognize, Lord, that no message that is ever preached can be effective if it's not done in the power of your spirit. If it's, if it's not delivered with, Lord, a, 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 a humility and a reliance and a dependence on you. I pray that this would never be done in my strength. I pray, Lord, that even as we listen to sermons and Bible studies week in and week out, that the listening would, would be equally as a spirit dependent. I, I pray that every time that your word is opened, that we would rightly understand that the, the fleshly mind, the carnal mind, cannot understand the things of the spirit. And it requires your Holy Spirit to illuminate these words. 
And that's why the world cannot see the value of your word, because they're not seeing it as eternal and God-breathed and authoritative and infallible as we are. I pray, Lord, that if we see it as those things, that we would live and obey it as those things. That when we read your word, that it would, we would receive it as the God of all creation communicating himself to a, a, a people who, Lord, are, are so undeserving, but also commanding and instructing his people to shape them into the image of his son. I pray that we would receive it like that. I pray that we would look at your word as our final authority, that it would not be a negotiation of what to obey and, and which sections we can waffle on, but we would look at all of it as, as literal truth that guides us and communicates who you are. I pray that as a result of studying this, we would worship you more passionately. And, and Lord, that you would fill our heads, our hearts with knowledge of you through your word. Thank you for uh, this, this group of uh, committed, faithful people tonight. I pray that you would bless their faithfulness and their persistence to take in truth. All these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we're going to look at three different things when it comes to preaching. I'm going to preach about preaching. The first thing is this. This is going to be really, really simple because this phrase that we're going to read in verse 1 is very, very simple. It's number one, if you're looking at your notes, is the proclamation of the word. Preaching at its heart is this, the proclamation of the word. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. But you, okay, now let's, let's stop there. Who is speaking and who is being spoken to? Paul is speaking. Who is he speaking to? Titus. Okay. But you, Titus, you're to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. You're to proclaim things consistent with with sound teaching, the proclamation of the word. This is really simple and straightforward. I, I, I'm not gonna, we're not going to run through any theological hoops. What do you think Paul is instructing him to do? That. Uh, proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. This is a very, very, very simple and straightforward command. There's a few layers, though, that I want to kind of pull out from the text and uh, bring to our attention tonight. First thing is this. We've talked about this before in this room, in this series, about job descriptions. This is one of the things that when you talk about job descriptions, we've talked in chapter 1 how you know, the, the, the qualifications for elders largely were concerned with the man's reputation, character, and integrity, and not so much with his skill or ability. However, this is one that churches, I, I will say rightly, this is usually the first thing in the list of responsibilities of a pastor. The first thing is to proclaim the word, to preach the word. And I think that is the one thing that we get right, because this is true. But regardless of job descriptions or priorities of pastor search teams, the scripture is clear all the way through that the responsibility, the primary responsibility of the elder is to proclaim God's word. And that is something I think we can, for the most in, in, in among verse 9, in the section about qualifications, the last qualification was this, holding to the faithful message as taught so that what? What does it say in verse 9? He'll be able to do two things. Encourage with sound teaching and refute those who contradict it. That's preaching. Proclamation of the word. This is the, the main thing. He says, Titus, I, I want you to understand that in all the things that are happening, there's a lot of, of layers to what it means to be a pastor, but the primary responsibility is to proclaim the word of God. It's also the first responsibility mentioned in the book of First Timothy, which is a, a kind of a, an analogous uh, field manual, a similar field guide to making healthy churches. 1 Timothy 1.3, Paul tells Timothy, as I urged you when I went to Macedonia, so that you may instruct the people. Again, same thing. First thing that he wants him to do, you've got to teach the people. You can have all of the ministries. And I think this is an area, I'm going to pause for a second in my notes, and I, I want to kind of talk through this. There, th this is an area where I think churches, we, we have drifted in part, in, in the United States especially, in wanting something different than what God's word instructs. What we want is entertainment 
and we, what we want is somebody to be relevant. That's the word that I hear thrown out all the time. Even when you're looking through pastor, uh, like, like uh, uh, job postings for pastors, we want somebody to preach relevant, exciting messages. And, and that's fine. Yeah, obviously, we want messages to impact people where they are, but the, the problem is in that insistence on being relevant and on being powerful and emotional and, and transformational, what we're, what we're doing is we're departing from Scripture and we're, we're finding out what are the ways that I can make that happen and, and use this as, as kind of just a baseline. I, I will tell you, preaching through the book of Hebrews has not been easy. You're, you're, you're sitting here and you may say, listening to you preach through the book of Hebrews has not been easy. But especially when we go through verse, uh, chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10, it is a lot of the same information presented again and again and again. And if you understand the point of the book of Hebrews, Paul or whoever is writing this, is, is saying, I, I, I want you to understand, don't be pulled back into the old patterns. Don't be pulled back into the old religious system you were in. Trust Christ because he's greater. But there's only so many times that you can say that before there is a weight of feeling like, man, I've already said this before again and again and again. And my flesh has felt that in the last couple of weeks as I've sat and prepared one of the questions I've asked that I, I'm just being real with you guys, I've had to squash in my heart, is how do I make this sound new? How do I make this feel different? How do I make this sound like I'm not repeating myself? But the truth is, if God's word repeats itself, then what should we be doing? Repeating it. We should say it as it says. We should proclaim it as it is there. And so I, I think this is where churches sometimes have, have fallen by the wayside is in feeding people something that's new and something that's interesting. And let's just, let's just always be exciting. And let's just always be so relevant. And what that boils down to in many churches you'll go to is you're going to get a sermon that looks like this. Ten easy steps to whatever. Ten easy steps to growing in your faith. Uh, five simple keys to unlocking discipleship. And you, you get a lot of those messages, and those make you feel like, action steps. I can do that. I can go and I can do those things. But what that's leading people into is to a very shallow understanding of God's word. Because when you are creating those action steps, very rarely does it come out of the scripture itself. Most often when the pastor is making those kind of sermons, he is creating the action steps and then finding scripture to hang on those pegs. To say, oh, let's say if my, if my action step is to guard your heart, ooh, I, I know Proverbs 4.24 says, guard your heart above all else. So I'm going to use that and stick it on there. The difference in what we promote here at First Baptist Church is expositional or expository preaching, which is we take a book that here, it, it, when, when it comes to Paul, especially as he's It's, a, it's an open-ended question. There's no right answer. Yeah, I, I think you're all right in where you're going. I, as, as he was trained as a Pharisee, one of the things that they were instructed in was the sequential teaching of the law. So that is something that he was very familiar with. But then when he was t taken under the wing of Barnabas and he learned under him, he went away for a few years before he entered into public ministry in Jerusalem. You see him... Uh, being instructed, and the book of Galatians says instructed by the Lord Jesus himself, and so he learns this, but I, I want to see, by and large, I'm, I'm, zoom out a little bit, we're looking a little too deep, zoom out, he learned this in the first churches. In the earliest churches, when you go to the beginning of the book of Acts, you see that their primary focus is the preaching of the word. You see it in Acts chapter 2, Peter's sermon is what the Holy Spirit uses when, when the Holy Spirit falls on the people in order to give birth to the church at Pentecost. It was a sermon that started it all. I mean, obviously the Holy Spirit and the, the sound of rushing wind and, it, and all that drew the people there, but Peter didn't miss the opportunity to preach, and it says it pierced their hearts and they repented of their sins. Then right after that, Acts 2.42, it says the, those first believers, they devoted themselves to what? The apostles' teaching. 
the first thing. Now, they did other things. They broke bread together. They prayed together. Uh, they, they took up offerings to, to help the poor. They did all these things, but they devoted themselves first to the apostles' teaching. Acts 3, Peter and John go, and they, they, uh, the Lord performs a mighty miracle through them. They heal a crippled man at the gate of the temple. They gather a crowd around, and what does Peter do? Many people are saved as a result. Acts 4, 33. It's, it's preaching. It's, it's teaching the word again and again and again. Acts chapter 6, verse 2, the apostle said it would not be right for us to give up what? The preaching of God, the preaching of the word of God to wait on tables. You'll find this again and again and again. That this is where Paul, by and large, learned what ministry looked like was by the ministry of the early church. And where did the early church, where did those apostles learn ministry from? From Jesus himself, from the master teacher, every time that he went into a new community, he taught. And that was, that was why he came. And so you see it again and again, the proclamation of the word. At, at its very core, this is what the ministry of the elder needs to be. If there is, and, and, and again, we're, we, we can talk about this a lot in terms of uh, churches and how they function in their ecclesiology. Maybe there's elders that are over certain things. But one of the requirements that stands out as, as compared or contrasted with the requirements or qualifications for deacons, is that he be able to teach. And so that's, this is a unique ministry among, among elders specifically, the proclamation of the word. Now, let's look at this because I think there's more layers to this than just saying God's word. Because anybody could stand up here and read this. I mean, right? Is, is, it, is it special or is it unique? Is, is the pulpit barred from people just coming up here and reading Scripture? Okay, I, I, maybe I'm phrasing this in a weird way, and you're looking at me like, are you tricking me? Is this something? No, no, that's not the point. The point isn't just the proclamation of Scripture. Although Paul did tell Timothy to read the Scripture. He, he, he instructed him to read the Scripture out loud. The difference here is that what he says in, in chapter 2, verse 1, is that you are to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. So it's not just reading the Word, but it's teaching what the Word means and how that applies to our lives today. And the second thing I want you to consider in here proclaim is the word laleo. It is, it is really, really simple, and it, it, it's just the most common word for in the sentence is where I want to kind of explore just a little bit because it's tricky. It's not just saying, hey, just, just get up there and talk. Talk about good things. Uh, because any, anybody that, that is consistent, he's not saying anything that's outwardly heretical until he gets into the, the health and wealth prosperity and when he's saying what God desires of you is physical things instead of spiritual reality. But for the most part, he's not, he's not, if you nicely into that category, but this is not what it's talking about. When it says proclaiming things consistent with sound teaching, the CSB, that's how it renders it. it the new claiming the word, make sure that your, your sermons are lining up with sound doctrine, with established uh, orthodox doctrine, okay? I'm going to throw this out, though. I don't believe either of those translations get it perfect. I, and it, maybe they get it technically right, but I think they miss the spirit of the command. Paul is not just telling Titus, 
make sure that the elder sermons are theologically accurate, although that is very, very important. He's, he spent the last chapter showing that the difference in the lifestyle, attitude, action, character, and reputation of the elder is really what's at stake versus the average citizen of Crete. So there's two versions of the Bible that I believe capture this a little bit more effectively. The first one is the New English translation, the net translation. It's not very popular, and it's, it's relatively new. Jordan, do you remember when it came out? It had to have been in the last 10 years. Something, something to that extent. Uh, but this is what the, the net or the New English translation says. Communicate the behavior that goes with sound teaching. Uh, I think that is a little bit closer to getting to what Paul is instructing here. And then I, this, is, this is the best, I think, rendering. It's the NLT, the New Living Translation. And it says this, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Okay, so you see the difference about communicating truth, communicate things that are fitting for doctrine. But I, I believe what the spirit of the text here, the focus is equally on theological accuracy, but also on godly character. So this happens in two ways. The elder needs to teach faithful obedience, and he needs to teach in such a way that promotes faithful obedience. John MacArthur said it like this, we must proclaim the saving message. Yes, we must give a clear word about sin and judgment, repentance and faith. But it has to be made believable by our lives. It does no good to speak about a God who can save you when you show a life that doesn't evidence it. This is in line, I believe, with Paul's intent to Titus. Don't just say the words show them that you believe it and show them that this word has transformed you because you're speaking to a group of people we've talked about at the end of Titus 1 who, who are, uh, what are the things that it says here? They're, they're defiled, they're unbelieving, their, their mind, their conscience are defiled. They claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. So you, Titus, when you speak the word, live in a way that promotes godly living. Live in a way that shows that you believe what this what you're saying. Let me, let me put it in, into a, maybe a, a way that we can kind of talk about it a little bit. Think about the, the high-profile pastors who have fallen into sin in, in the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years. It's, it's, they're a dime a dozen. They're, they're happening every week. Somebody has fallen into sin. How do you respond or react to a pastor's sermons after he has had his reputation so think about this. I'll say, for me, I was a I saw him speak five times at different conferences. I listened to uh, his, his messages. He was the very first pastor in the United States to put a sermon on the Internet. And, it, and he, he, I mean, they, pay, they paid thousands and thousands for that early technology. He was one of the first campuses, or one of the first churches where they used satellite campuses, and they were broadcasting messages to all the different campuses. I, I, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Reputation was ruined, and he was asked to leave Mars Hill, and he resigned in disgrace. How does that color the way that I looked at his sermons? Or how should it color the way that we look at sermons, or, or any pastor. It, it should give you pause, at the very least. You should stop and say, man, I don't know. He, this was a pretty egregious sin that he was caught in, so is, is he somebody that I need to be listening to? Is this something that I need to be doing? Jordan and I had this conversation today about a book that he brought that uh, he, the foreword of it was written by Bill Hybels. And you may have known Bill Hybels. He was one of the, the church growth gurus. He was one that grew a church in like in Illinois. It was a Chicago area. I mean, he, it was a, a very substantial church, and he fell into sexual sin. And so Jordan brought that book to me and said, what do you think about a book like this? Is this okay to read now that we know that? And we had a good dialogue about this. And, and I think there's times that you, we need to use some discernment and say, you don't throw a baby out with the bathwater because th there is teaching that's probably very accurate and, and maybe we could eat and spit out bones. But have a, a moment of discernment and take some pause and say, I'm not going to take everything at face value, which as Berean believers we shouldn't do anyway. 
You should never look at anybody's teaching and just wholesale take it all and say, yep, I believe every word because he said it. Use your discernment, your God-given discernment. But the truth is, if a person falls in that we saw here at the end of Titus 1, then that is largely going to ruin his teaching ministry. People will lose confidence. If, if you are a, a, a person who is, is teaching on sexual sin, and then it's found out that you have fallen into sexual sin, I mean, who would believe him then? If, if he gets up to speak again, what would we say? We would say, why should I believe you? You're not living what you're saying. And so I believe here is when we talk about the, the, to proclaim these things consistent with sound teaching, it's not just to proclaim, but to, to live in a way that's consistent with sound teaching. Now, I want to take the focus a little bit off the participation of the church. We talked about the proclamation of the word, the reputation of the elder. Now let's talk about the participation of the church. Let's just read through verses 2 through 10, and then um, I'm going to... This, we're not going to study through every word. We're just going to read it because I want you to see just something very specific connected to the teaching ministry. So verse 2 says, Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible. In way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, to excessive drinking. They're to teach what is good so that they may encourage their children to be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind, and in submission to their husbands so that God's word will not be slandered. In the same way, the young men to be self-controlled. Ooh, that's a task. In everything, make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. There it is. You see it again. The, the reputation of the elder. You have to make yourself an example. Submit to their masters in everything and to be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness so that the teaching of God our Savior in everything. Okay, I'm not going to go through. We are, next time we get together, we are going to study through. Is done faithfully and consistently. Then verses 2 through 10 will happen naturally. Okay, so if... The word is proclaimed. These verses are instructions, but they're more than that, they're descriptions of He has a lot of followers on social media. Does it mean that he has uh, just an extent a pastor preaches so that people will know more about the Lord? Also, so that the patterns of their thinking would, uh, would consistently reflect the word. One of my favorite things that I love to hear is, and, and you, know, you know, we've talked about this several times. I, I don't enjoy when people come and say, that was a great sermon. We've talked about this. I would rather people come and say, what a wonderful Savior that we I've never thought about it like that before. That really, that really gets me. I love that because that, that means that we've, we've done something important here. We've connected God's word to a way that you have thought about it and then said, I need to make a change in the way or the way that I have thought about this before. It's one of my favorite things, head change. We're, we're praying and we're preaching for this goal so that, that we would fill our heads with knowledge and so that knowledge would lead us to think differently about whatever. Then the second thing is heart change. Heart change. Head change by itself isn't going to do anything. And I'm, I think that now, but if you don't do anything with it, what's, what's the point? It's got to migrate down to your heart. Romans chapter 6, verse 17, Paul, in a very confusing section, I'm just going to pull out one, one little phrase, but he said this about the people. He was talking about sin and how God has called them out of it. He says this, but thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart a pattern of sound teaching. The time to go through every point, but 
the heart of what he's saying is there is you used to be one thing. The Holy Spirit took a hold of you. I'm, I'm seeing what is sound teaching. I'm hearing this. I'm receiving it. And I'm obeying from the heart. So we're looking for heart change. And then also hand change. And that's not the best way to say it, but it started with H. So I'm, we're talking about specific actions. Again, head change is to do something. If you look at Romans 12, you don't have to do this. I encourage you to look at it at some point, though. Paul's instructing the church on behavior that accompanies genuine faith. So if you say that you really believe, what should your life look like? And in verses 9 through 21, this is one of my favorites, and it doesn't, it doesn't translate to They were listening and engaging and understanding that I do. But at the, at the heart of this, if an elder faithfully proclaims the word in a way that's consistent with sound teaching, then godly behavior should be spiritually. If a church isn't growing, who is to blame? Okay, you, They can't hear your words on the live stream. They can only hear me. So you, you have anonymity here in, in this. Who's to blame if a church isn't growing? If by and large a church is stagnant or maybe they're receding or backsliding, who's to blame for this? Okay. Who's had both? Okay, I like that. I appreciate that my wife is the one that's kind of throwing the blame up here. Yeah, both, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think, I, I think that's, a, that's a dead end question. As we wrap this section up, however, if a church is stubbornly Defiantly not growing, then you also have to look and say, are they being, is scripture being communicated? Jordan almost said the thing that you and I hate to hear, and that's, are they being fed? You know, I, I hear that, and it's one of the things that hurts in my ministry. I'm just not being fed. And I've said this from the pulpit several times. My job isn't necessarily to feed you. Really, what I would love to do is disciple you through the pulpit ministry, and teach you how to, how to pick up a spoon and feed yourself. That's, that's the goal. If your whole diet of Scripture consists in what I present to you for that from the mouth of God, Jesus is declaring that it is more important to consume God's Word than it is to consume daily food. And so that's, that's something that we have to look at both sides of this. Okay, follow up to that question, how do you fix it? Ooh. This is all hypothetical. I want you all to understand that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's a, a valid question. If if so, let's let's use hypothetical. If sound teaching is happening, and and behavior change, heart change, life change is not. Where you say, how long do we do this? And, and, and there's, there's stories either way. I've known missionaries who have said, hell will not prevail against it. He's talking about the big C church, the, the, the global body of Christ. Individual. To remove a church's lampstand or candlestick from them, which means if he does that, then that church ceases.
to exist. Its, its witness is lost in it, and it ceases to exist. And so that we look at that. Also, I think on the part of the church, the church has to rightly discern, is sound teaching happening? Is, is it happening? It may be, maybe the deficiency is in can the congregation do? Let me, let, me, let me phrase it in this way. What do congregations usually do? They get rid of them or they leave. That's, that, I mean, not 100%. They say, this isn't worth it, and they leave. I'm not being fed. I'm going to go somewhere else. Or they run him out, and, and, and that happens. What happens in that situation to the man who leaves is that he's going to go. Maybe he doesn't know. Maybe he's not been trained. I, I, among our staff, we have people that haven't all been at Bible college. Not like that makes all of the difference, but looking at it in that way, what maybe should be happening in that situation is a little bit of grace, encouragement toward growth. Say, hey, man, we, we've we've noticed that we could probably go a little deeper. Is, is there is there a class, or is there you know maybe there's some. Uh, some some distance learning that we can do. Uh, we have several seminaries on distance. We could say let's let's work on this together, and that is a spirit of unity that I think a lot of churches don't necessarily have. But anyway, these are all open-ended hypothetical. On um, is it time? It's probably time. I got a little bit of time. Let's let's talk about this. If if this is so important, then I want to explore the relationship between the elders' teaching ministry and the church's growth. Because they are linked. It, you're not going to grow beyond your intake of the Word of God. And from the pulpit, it means in your own life as well. But two things I want you to see. It's on the back of your notes. The first one is this. The church grows in the Lord's sovereignty, not in the elder's skill. The church grows in the Lord's sovereignty, not in the elder's skill. Let's go to a couple of passages together. If you still have your Bibles, I'd love for you to join me. If not, I can read it for you. I am okay doing that as well. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Both of these examples I'm giving you from the Apostle Paul. So I'm going to show you his consistency across, across all his ministry. It says in Ephesians 4, 11, And he himself, okay, so we're, we're talking about the Lord, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some, what, pastors and teachers, to do what? Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity, and here's the key, with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. That's where I'm going to stop, just in, in that section. I, I want you to see there's a couple of things, and I'm not going to be able to go verse by verse through this. God uses pastors and teachers to grow his church. He does this. It says that he, he, he appointed these people to build the church, to equip them for the work of ministry, okay? But ultimately, it's not the preacher's skill or ministry prowess that grows a church. You saw that toward the end in verse 14. It's not by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. It's not about how effectively or how well or how cleverly I can preach. It's not about that. That doesn't grow a church. The Lord's... A farmer, by his own power and his own strength, What can he do? Perfect. He, he, what he does is he creates the best environment for growth. He, he, he feeds it. He waters it. He pulls weeds. Uh, he nurtures it, Mindy said. That, that's a great way to look at this. He does those things, but ultimately a seed grows because to grow. That's what seeds do. But God oversees the biological processes that break a seed in the earth and cause it uh, 
designed it in that direction. And so in the same way, pastors don't grow the church. He can contribute toward an environment that promotes growth. And they should. This should be an We should be feeding, watering, caring, pulling weeds, defending from birds. We're scarecrows, I guess, in the, in the church, defending from outside invasion. But the truth is, a disciple grows because it's in his nature to grow. That's why, because the Lord has put in him the desire and the ability to grow. And God sovereignly oversees all the necessary spiritual processes that make that happen. So the church grows in the Lord's sovereignty. We've got to understand that. The second thing, the church grows for the Lord's glory, not the elder's gain. The church grows for the Lord's glory, not the elder's gain. Colossians chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 9 through 14. Just a couple of pages over. Colossians 1, 9 says, For this reason, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking. That they're trying to build a platform. They're trying to build a ministry. robbing God of the glory that he deserves. This is not about me. Very frequently, a prayer right before a sermon, and I, I appreciate this, and it says, hide me, or sometimes it'll be about the pastor, hide our pastor behind what? Behind the cross. I, I love that idea that this is not about what's happening here, it's about what's happening in the word, in the congregation, but all for the glory of God. Okay. What does this mean for me sitting in the pew? This is where I'm going to end. I promise this is, this is it. This is where I'm going to end, the takeaways. So if the important part of this is the proclamation of the word, for you sitting in the pew, what do you do? You listen carefully. If there is something that you can do and participate in this process, it's, it's listen. It's, it's be receptive. Hear the words of God as, as they are proclaimed and, and receive them with joy. Listen carefully. If the reputation of the elder is just as important, then the congregation's responsibility is to look prayerfully. Look prayerfully. Consider, discern, look at my life, look at the life of our, of our leadership. Not as, as a way to find occasion to throw stones, but to look and say, are, are we as faithful as we can to the Lord in this work? And then if the participation of the church is equally important, then live faithfully. Walk out of here with the, with the sense of, I'm going I'm to obey what God says. I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm not, I'm not going to just sit and receive forever, but I'm, I'm going to actually get out there and live and obey him from the heart. So we've talked a lot. Let's, uh, let's wrap this up and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Um, and uh, let's, well, yeah, Logan, I appreciate you if you'll cut that live stream and then we'll uh, I mean, we've talked quite a bit, so um, if you have questions, we can, we can talk through them, of course, but let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this very simple but necessary instruction that the word needs to be proclaimed, and it needs to be consistent with sound teaching, and it needs to promote godly living. It needs to come from a place of, of godly character, and it needs to flow into receptive hearts that will submit to your word and then live godly lives. I pray that the word would constantly be shaping us. Pray from us what should not be and that you would plant your, your fruit in us consistently, that we would see love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, and all of the fruits of the spirit growing in us to great measure. I pray, Lord, that you would be seen in us, that you'd be reflected in us, that we would grow, we would shine you out. Lord, make my life uh, an example of faithfulness and integrity so that, Lord, I could communicate your truth as effectively as possible to your congregation. Lord, thank you for this church. We talk hypothetically, but we are, I'm so grateful that I get each and every week to see growth happening. And I see it and I hear the stories and I'm so grateful that you prove again and again and again that you are not done, that you are still working, that the fields are still white to harvest and you're still calling people into your, into your harvest. And I pray, Lord, that we would, as a church, just embrace that, be faithful and run the race to the very, very end. We love you. We praise you. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus. We pray. Amen.